Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar on Advanced Asset Optimization and Risk Mitigation Part 1 for Refineries and Chemical Plants. So I'm going to introduce the people behind the scenes, my fellow STEAM collaborators, who will be answering your questions to you. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Norm White, the Executive Vice President of DLV. Good morning, everyone. And next is John Walter, the Business Development Manager but formerly the International Consulting and Engineering Services Manager. Good morning, everybody. And Andrew Moore, who is the Consulting and Engineering Services Manager of TLV Corporation. Good morning. And Justin McFarland, who is the Engineering Manager of TLV Corporation. Hello and good morning. Now we're going to show you examples, real world examples of things that we've been able to take a look at and help the, the client site mitigate. However, even though it may look exactly alike, you know this, if you have heat exchanger A and heat, heat exchanger B, they look exactly alike and yet they perform differently. So because of that, I'm going to say that please do not rely on any of this information as a general rule. We want to look at the specific applications to help you. And the other thing is we're only talking about our products. So if we may say, don't use this type of product on a steam main or something like that, that's relative to our type of products because we're talking about what we know about how our products work in applications. All right, so please read the disclaimer. And then we're gonna get started. I'm gonna ask my collaborators and myself, we'll turn off our cameras and then we'll get started. So we're gonna to talk today about optimizing equipment flares, turbines, reboilers, and people also asked us to do cokers. So if you want to read about advanced steam system optimization, you could read this article from Alan Ho and Tetsuya Mita. These are two people in Japan, including top management, and they wrote this in hydrocarbon processing. It's on the website. What we normally talk about with steam system optimization program is three different phases. But today, we're not gonna focus on trap management or the steam balance. We're gonna focus on equipment management specifically to identify incidents and bottlenecks and how to optimize the performance of those assets. There's a great article written by Dr. Brian Kane, who is an asset integrity specialist at TLV Company Limited. And he talks about risk mitigation relative to API 580 and 581. And if you have a chance, please read that because this presentation is going to include both uh, assets of steam system optimization program and risk mitigation. When we talk about risk mitigation, we don't want to see damage flares or flare out instances. With cokers, we don't want to see stuff like that. And we don't want to see damaged or worn turbines. We're not going to cover coils too much today, but when you see stratified coils, and definitely we're going to cover reboilers and heat exchangers. When you see stratified heat exchangers, this is not really good for them and it hurts that asset. It also hurts the performance of that asset. It creates production problems, but it also creates maintenance issues and sometimes unscheduled shutdowns. So let's take a look at your steam heat asset. And that's what it is. You refer to it as a steam system, but it's an asset. You've got four different areas, distribute, use it, return it, and generate it. But that asset is the way that you get heat to your production process for the most part. Sometimes you have exothermic reactions, but your steam heat asset is the majority of your heat in most of your applications. So we want dry steam. We want to drain it fast out of equipment so we get the maximum performance. And we want to recover it. We don't want to put burden on our boilers. However, we're going to focus now on dry steam. Yes. If you have a Herzig that's got a superheater section, or if you just have a superheater, you've got the driest steam possible. No question about it. But a lot of you have what you call saturated steam. For those of you that attended prior presentations, you know what I'm gonna say next. You don't have saturated steam, never. What you have is wet steam because steam leaves the boiler three to five percent wet if it isn't superheated and by the time it gets down to your system that's why you sometimes call it the wet end of the system well the fact of the matter is all of your steam if it is not superheated is wet steam at saturation temperature 
If you want to read more about that, I just did this article in Chemical Engineering in May. It's on our website, Steam Quality Consideration. It shows an awful lot of information. I hope you please have a chance to read that. So prior, if you attended the water hammer sessions, we talked about water hammer and steam mains and causes and how to mitigate it. But mostly water hammer and steam mains is caused by cold or traps that don't drain. So I also did this article in Chemical Engineering Progress in 2013, talks about the dangers of cold traps. Your steam utility system is providing steam heat asset to your production process. How can you ever optimize your production process if your heat is suboptimal? You really want to pay a lot of attention for everything we're going to talk about today, flares, turbines, to make sure that the quality of your utility system is perfect, as perfect as can possibly be. So we're going to mitigate that. And you have to understand that steam is wet. It's either superheated or wet. So we've got water flowing along the bottom that's already been disentrained out of the system. We have got to remove that condensate through drainage systems. We say condensate discharge locations or CDLs. You might call them steam traps or trap sets. But water is entrained in steam. That's really not good for flares, and it's really not good for turbines and a lot of other things. But we're going to talk about turbines and flares today. So we have to handle the water that drains along the bottom and the water that's entrained in the steam. Let's review, for those of you that didn't attend the other sessions, that your normal steam velocity is 90 to 100 miles an hour in a pipe. And if you get a slug buildup, that could be high velocity, definitely over four or 500 miles an hour. And then you get an, uh, an incident, normally at a vertical riser. Well, what if that's running up top of the flare line to hit a flare tip? What if that's going into a turbine blade? So we want to prevent the possibility of slugs. What if that slug is going to run down the line and go to your coker system, go to your coker valves, your delta valves, your ball valves? That's really not good for that. That's going to cause an abrupt temperature difference and a heat maintenance problem, and it will create some of those difficulties that we're talking about. So absolutely, positively, fight like crazy, please, for that budget money to always take care of your utility system. That's got to be perfect, as perfect as possible. Let's take a look at flares. We want to help avoid erosion of the tips and control issues, flare outs, damage to the flares. So I'm going to show you some of the problems that we've seen. You can check off if you've ever seen or heard about this. Tip erosion, slug fracture, backflow, extinguishing the pilot, water spray coming out. I mean, we've we've been the issues where we take drones and we, we've had drones go up over to flare and you can see it looks like a water fountain. We call it the Trevi fountain. <laughs> and then of course, one of the most uh, current things is recordable events. If you have water moisture or slugs tripping flow meters and that might cost $35,000, $40,000 per event, but it can be avoided. Now, the difficulty with flares and with coker systems is they're usually pretty far away from something, and people pay not to pay a lot, of, a lot of attention to the utility lines. But you have to pay attention to those utility lines. Those are such critical processes to your production. So when we go to see flare problems and we see broken piping anchors or distorted piping, well, that's caused from water hammer. We know that's caused from water hammer. It means the system isn't draining. That's a relatively simple fix. There's no reason for that. It might be that the trap was installed wrong or selected improperly. And when you have a vertical rise like that going up to the trap, you get a steam lock. You don't want to do that. You want the trap down here low, down here. You don't want it up here or up here. That's going to create a steam lock. We talked about that in the previous sessions. Sometimes there's missing drain points. I mean, it's so inexpensive to put a trap in there relative to, what is it, a million and a half dollars to replace a flare tip? You can go to, on you know, Google Earth and you can take a look at any flare system like I've done here, and you can spot the flares. You know, it's a half a mile walkout or longer, remote locations, pressure variations from when you're flaring to not flaring, load variations, the same circumstances. So, okay, so we can see a nice little graphic like this. There you see the flare tower and or column, in, and you've got the steam line going up to it and the control valve station. 
Does anyone see a problem here? Now, if you attended a previous session, you know what the problem is. I'm going to ask you to just look at that and say, can you see the problem? So when you're bypassing, you're not going to have any problem there because you got steam going up right through here. Okay, but what about this line right here? You're going to have condensate build up there, and there's no trap to drain it. So when that control valve opens, bam, you're going to send the slug right up to the tip. So the simple fix for that is just to have a trap station there. Okay, most of you know about effective collecting leg design. And, you know, this comes from ASHRAE. You know, people pay a lot of attention to the D1 diameter. They all know that you shouldn't have on a, on a six inch line or an eight inch line, you shouldn't have a one inch collecting leg. But what people don't pay attention to all the time and the contractors don't pay attention to is this very critical L dimension. I'm gonna show you what I mean. We walked a flare line somewhere in the Gulf Coast and look at how close that takeoff is for the trap. There was no distance and it was a bucket trap which is cyclical which meant that they were getting a lot of water into their system and a lot of water up into the flare tip. So, you know, when a drain pocket's installed like that, you can't really take all these collecting, you know, side takeoffs and put them down here. So what we had to do in that case is give them some mitigation efforts where either we came out of the mud lake and created another false mud lake beneath it and put the trap down lower there to get head pressure on the trap and we give them an instantaneous discharge trap or here we did it off of this way, another way to do it. If you didn't have the vertical distance off the bottom, you could do it this way here. Not ideal. And you could make this pipe whatever diameter you wanted to, to make sure that you had uh, enough of a, a reservoir before the trap, especially if you're getting slugs coming down the line. Much better though, if you're in the projects team, to make sure that you have the proper collecting leg, not only the D1 distance, but the L distance, so when we walk a flare line, here's a flare line that we walked. It was 800 feet off of a 12 inch line. And we can take a look at where the steam traps are. And they're noted there with the green circles. Well, that was great, six traps. But where it needed the trap, one, two, three, four, five, six, they needed six traps. Isn't it worthwhile to add six traps to your flare line if it'll make your flare system that much more reliable? So when we take a look at a, what we call a flare drain application, an FDA, flare drain application, we like to use those acronyms for drain applications. You'll see a bunch of them in here. But the flare drain application is we're gonna do a walkthrough and we'll sketch it out and we'll put that data on a data sheet called an FDA. And here's, um, you know, we wanna take a look at minimizing condensate and supply lines. We want to make sure that people don't put in the wrong traps. If Even if they're TLV traps, we don't want you to put in thermostatic traps on that line. We do want to use either uh, float traps or power traps on that line, depending on how everything is installed. So here's what a flare drain application looks like. All of our applications are forms that have a four-person check. You know, people have bad days. We don't want them to have bad days. But we don't want you to get a report back from just one person. So it'll pass from a review engineer to a senior engineer to an engineering manager. It will pass through four people and it will have four stamps of people that reviewed every single application if it's on a drainage application form. So you put in data here or we'll take the data here on the different flares. And you can get an idea to take a look at that data. Then we're gonna make product selections. If you've already got traps, we'll take a look at the condition of the traps and note them here. But where you don't have traps, we'll give you the TLB models and sizes that we think that you should have. So on the control valve, we'd like to see traps ahead of it, a strainer, we like to see separators, float traps, and float traps after it. Sometimes there has to be a power trap, but that'll be explained on the site. Now, why a separator? Separators remove 98% moisture if you have a high quality separator, and that gives you about as close to dry steam as you're going to get. Again, if you read the article in May, you'll see the numbers for that. 
when people install stuff, we don't want to see the traps up here. We want to run the traps down to the base where they can easily be checked and have maintenance action. So a typical system light might look like that. Of course, we have separator here. We have strainers in the line. But a typical system might look something like that. We can give you a 3D model off of Inventor, and you can run it into your programming. And that's pretty much it for flares. Now, let's take a quick look at a coker unit and how to reduce issues with unheading valves. Normal issues that we would see is clogging, broken valve stems, block traps, things like that. So uh, this is a diagram that Milan publishes, and it's about their valves. And they show you where the different connection points are. And one of the things they say is purge valves need high quality steam to be free from wetness. And that's really what we're talking about. How do you get high quality steam free from wetness? Well, there's two things that you do. You have to handle the condensate that's already been disentrained along the bottom of the pipeline through a trap station or a condensate discharge location. And then you want to disentrain the moisture that's still in the steam, particularly when you're far away and you've had all the radiant losses and convection losses coming off of that pipeline. Even though the insulation may be 80 or 85% effective, you still have exposed flanges, you've got pipe supports, you know, and you might actually have insulation that's not in great shape. So the way to take care of that is you put in condensate discharge locations, you pay high attention to those details when you do the trap surveys to make sure that those traps are functional and draining condensate. And then you have separation before you come into that and you get high quality steam going into your coker purge valves because supply headers need good functioning steam traps. And this is another uh, graphic out of the lawn showing the drain points, the connection and drain points. If the traps are blocked or don't exist, Wet steam can lead to increased torque. And increased torque is going to cause broken couplings and valve stems. So if you've experienced that, you know, basically it's because the traps are not getting, you know, they're not draining condensate. You're not getting enough heat into the valves. And that's causing some viscosity issues and it's causing increased torque. It's simple. Make sure the traps are in good shape. So if we take a look at a delta valve, this might be the typical application that we'll see. But what's wrong with this? Well, the traps can block, and then a lot of times people will bypass it with steam loss. So we like to use a specialized piping bottle, a basket strainer, and a certain model of trap. That's what we like to do, something like that. And you could actually carry this line further out here if you wanted to, being large. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make a bottle here to collect the junk that can be blown out. We don't want it to get into the trap, and there's the basket strainer to help protect the trap. Now, what Delta Valve says about this is, you know, they actually like to use TLV free float traps for this process. And they use our JH7. I would say a JH7 or a JH7.2 is going to be a good product to use off of a Delta Valve. Either one of those, you can always ask our consulting and engineering services team. You've got Andrew Moore, you've got Justin McFarland, who's on the line right now. But if you send any request for help into CES, at tlvengineering.com, you're going to get a specific application. If you just have general questions, you send it to questions at tlvengineering.com and you'll get an answer. All right, well, that's just a light, you know, with four things to cover in an hour, that's just a light, <laughs> a light review about coker systems. They can get a lot more detail than flares and cokers, believe me. Let's talk about turbines and pumps and what causes trips and damage to turbines. <clears throat> and what causes people to have bleeders, open bleeders, and slow rolling? You know, turbine, look at that animation. Isn't it just beautiful when they work like that? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So why do we see open bleeders, slow rolling? Why do we see so much damage in the turbine graveyard? You know, this blade erosion, that erosion is not coming from steam. That is coming from condensate with a lot of particles inside of it. And if that condensate had been removed ahead of time with both the condensate discharge location, get rid of the condensate that was already disentrained, and then a separation system to get disentrained the condensate in the wet steam, you wouldn't see that. Not rapidly to be sure. 
And why do we have governors sticking? These issues lead to lost production expensive repairs. So sometimes it's something as simple as, and this is again, it's for the projects team. Do not let anyone do this. Put in such a small collecting leg. Look at how pitiful that is. That is not going to get rid of slugs of condensate. And, you know, this is interesting. We'll often see casing drains plugged. <laughs> this was crazy. The casing drain was used as a bracing bolt. Okay. It's kind of funny. Yeah, that was that killed me. I saw that one tracing, um, using it as a bracing bolt. Okay, turbine problems. Here's a neat side. Here's a high-pressure turbine. And we're coming out of the high pressure side of the casing and we're going to a tlv power dyne trap appreciate that but this is the low pressure side of the turbine and somebody on the projects team i guess decided that they could save money by only putting in one trap so they connected there so your high pressure side and your low pressure side are connected which leads to a backflow of high pressure steam to the outlet side of the turbine and that sort circuit is causing a problem Please, if you're on the projects team, please be careful to make sure you have accurate, detailed drawings. We'll give them to you for free to make sure you have detailed drawings how the contractors should be installing your turbines. So this is an application we reviewed, and I'll show you soon what we did to the application off of that pump driver. This was somewhere in the Gulf Coast, somewhere between Florida and South Texas. Uh, that's what it looked like when they had just revamped it before they started it up. And this is kind of what it looked like. That's not an actual picture that they are there, but it was just like that. It was a fog zone. It was all taped off. So is your steam turbine properly drained? I'm going to show you a couple of things off of this drawing and you see if your turbines are like this. We look at points A through J. And I'm not going to let that's too much to read all at once, but we do have a process that we follow. We would never allow you to use one of our bimetal traps on this system because we know how we feel bimetals work. We would actually use a free flow trap. So I'm going to show you, if you don't know why, how a free flow works. Here we have a free flow trap with a window on it. And you see that it keeps a water seal and it's always got steam. It's always the hottest possible. There's always steam up here as long as it's properly sized. And you're always keeping a water seal over the orifice, whether you're at 100% of load, 80% of load, 50% of load. And the models that we use for turbines are good for superheat. So they actually have what's called three point seating and they'll be really tight sealing even under superheat conditions and that's why we use free floats all right so turbine drainage applications we have a tda form and it's got different input section and that's sort of the things that we try to input and then the same thing as the FDA will give you the actual product selections, the separator, what type of traps would be used, the size, the quantity. Now we like to use separators. Why? Well, according to Marx, the efficiency of a turbine stage is reduced about 1% for each 1% of moisture. So why would you install a piece of equipment and deliberately try or subconsciously try to reduce its efficiency this does not reduce the amount of steam that's used but you can improve the efficiency and more importantly the reliability of that turbine by disentraining all the moisture as much of the moisture as possible before it hits that turbine so we talk about with plv separators at least 98 percent moisture removal which brings you up to 99.7% or higher dry steam. So we might put a separator drain location here, provided that we've got a good CDL before it. We always want to have a CDL before it to get rid of the condensate that's already been disentrained 
And then we use the separator to remove the entrained condensate. And then here's the trap for that. That has to be sized. So that's an engineered separator drain solution. We've got an inlet trap to the control valve, a trip and throttle valve. If you look under your trip and throttle valves, a lot of times you'll just see two plugs and you won't see any traps on them. It's really a shame. And casing drain in the inlet side, casing drain in the outlet side, and the exhaust drain. So that turbine I showed you earlier that was in kind of like a fog zone, this was the solution that we ended up giving them. Of course, uh, that was the descriptive solution. We gave it to them without all the lettering also. And that's how to trap everything. So this type of detailed drawing is really, I think, best for the contractors that they can see it in 3D and they know exactly how everything has to be installed. And it precludes or helps mitigate against them installing something incorrectly. <clears throat> now, while I'm on turbines and before we get off of turbines, I'm going to ask you the question. What about gland seal steam? Don't trap the gland seal steam drain. So there's something called API 682 plant 62. And here's a drawing from one of the vendors. But look at this. This is actually incorrect. Because take a look at where that trap is going. The steam is coming in and the condensate is discharging right into the seal. You really don't want to do that. Okay. So what you do want to do is you want to trap it down here prior to the re pressure regulator. And that way, you know, you go here, here's your check valve, and your steam will have an open outlet safely piped to drain. It's not going to hurt anyone. But you want to get steam in here, but you want to get rid of the moisture before it goes through your pressure regulator. <laughs> now, if you really want to see a fantastic article on steam turbines, this is from one of my friends, Jimmy Kumana. At one time, he was the head of Lindhoff Marsh, which you might know today as KBC Advanced Technologies. Jimmy's a consultant. He's retired or semi-retired, but he still does a lot of work in Texas. No affiliation with TLV, but if you get a chance, if you want to read about steam turbines, please get that article. All right, mitigate issues in reboilers and heat exchangers. I mean, it looks so simple. We've got our reboiler and our control valve set, and here's our trap on the tube side steam. What's the problem? Well, I mean, we see these problems. And how do we get example to see that? Well, what we might see is recovery issues with condensate where they discharge to grade. <clears throat> we might see a bypass open. Both of these things create a lot of difficulty for the boiler because the boiler's got to make more steam if you're just dumping it. We'll see control valve cycling and we'll see off spec control. And we'll see hammering in the heater. But what we mostly see is channel head leaks, the gasket leaks. And of course, we have reduced production, and that can actually be a bottleneck on the system. So what can cause that? Well, you know, some things could happen just from air. So if we take a look at temperature profile, if we don't have air in the system or a significant amount of air in the system, we might get a really high temperature. But air can have a really huge impact. So if you've got a film of air, it might drop the temperature, something like that. But here's a question I like to ask people. A silly millimeter of air, 0 0.0393 or you know, 0 0.04 inches, that is a conductor, and that is equivalent to what size or thickness of copper? In order to get the same resistance, how thick would copper have to be? You're all probably scrambling for marks. It's a 13,000 times difference. It's 44 feet of copper thickness for just a little bit of air. So if you're having problems with any type of heat exchanger or reboiler, one of the first things to look at is how is it air vented? Uh, that can be a really simple fix and a really inexpensive fix. So vent air. But the other problem, and most of the problems we see, is pressure differential. So here we see the inlet to the trap, 
and the outlet to the trap. If the inlet pressure is greater than the back pressure, then you just need a steam trap. So let's take a look. Here's your back pressure, and here's your steam inlet pressure or your pressure inside the reboiler. <clears throat> that positive pressure is going to enable flow. So we've got a positive pressure there, positive pressure differential. As long as we maintain that, no problem. But if the inlet pressure sometimes can be equal to or less than the outlet pressure, then we cannot use a trap. And you see over here why. <clears throat> now we have some point where the excursion has a pressure that's less than the back pressure. How can an inlet pressure on the inlet side of a trap push and discharge condensate when the back pressure is higher? So when we take a look at traps and pumps, you can trap only when a trap pressure differential is always positive. When people have traps on applications where the back pressure can sometimes be higher than the inlet pressure to the trap, we will see excessive steam use because they will have open bypasses. They will be dumping the condensate to the grade because they can't get into the return header. And that's a waste of treated water. And when they dump the condensate into the sewer, they've got effluent handling costs. So here's an example if we would have a trap with a heat exchanger going into a return header and it can't get in there at some time they'll open the bypass and they'll just blow steam through the system everybody will think that's okay but that really creates a lot of hammer issues and high cost issues and it also loses duty out of the heat exchanger so a simple solution might just be to put a trap into a pump set there you go now you have to deal with the vent in this case but there's lots of things we can do for that. But that gets to condensate out without having to discharge the grade, and you can recover that condensate. So in this particular case, when we've got a trap going into a pump set, we use what's called a condensate recovery application, or CRA. Again, the TDAs, the FDAs, the CRAs, these are all checked by four people before you receive the answer back. So We'll put a data section in here and we'll give you the summary and we might show this is the load that we have, this is the flash load that you have, and down here we'll give you the size of the flash piping that you need. Six inches. And we'll give you all of the products. All right, so stall. Some of you have heard about stall and sometimes you haven't. I feel uniquely qualified to talk to you about stall since this was my creation. In 1978, I started studying why heat exchangers were getting corroded and damaged. And by the time 1983 came around with another gentleman, I co-created a product called the stall chart. And that since has been upgraded. But the implications when you have a stall condition is an open bypass, condensate degrade, and a blow through with level pot valves. People think that if I have a control valve on the outlet side and a level pot, that's really great. But actually, there's no secondary pressure to push it through. It's just an electronic steam trap. So if you've got a stall condition, whether you've got a mechanical steam trap or an electronic or pneumatic steam trap with a level pot and a control valve, doesn't make a difference. You still don't have enough pressure to get it into the return header. That's when the trap pressure or the control valve pressure on the outlet side is, is differential, is negative. Now, it's easy for us to see when we walk through a site. No problem at all. You walk through a site, you see a leak collar. That's already telling you that they have a thermal stratification and a hydraulic problem, right? So they're getting thermal stresses, they're getting hydraulic stresses, and it's creating problems with the channel head. And if we were to shoot a temperature on that, we would see something like this with stratification. So <clears throat> that's really a stall, which is kind of a cold trap failure. Even if the trap is functional, you take it apart and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not the trap that's bad. It's the pressure differential that's bad. So what operators will do is they open the bypass. And if you've heard my other webinars, I call that the double whammy. You damage equipment and you blow steam into the return header. It's really a triple whammy if you think about you're getting when you're blowing steam in the return hammer header you're getting water hammer but you're also having an energy loss so you get equipment damage water hammer and a condensate return and you know equipment uh and, and and you have condensate loss energy loss so 
you know, this is something that really is high profile to fix this, and it's really good quality to, to make your production more reliable. Let's take a look at how, when a flooded exchanger exists, when steam comes into it, you've got a big water mass. And that water mass is going to condense the steam that's going to come in, and it's going to cause damage like you see over here. So this is animation, but pretty soon you're going to see, over in here, you're going to see the real deal because we'll show you some actual tube dumbbells, and that's how they got damaged. We don't really like to flood heat exchangers. So if we take a look at proper heat transfer, we're going to elevate from T1 to T2, and that'll be 100% of our demand. That's estimated by this formula, MC sub P delta T. I'm going to call that Q demand, QD. Now we're going to supply heat, and I'm going to call that QS. Now, if you take a look at that formula, if I put too much heat in, I'm going to overcook it. And if I put too little heat in, I'm not going to cook it up enough. So I've got to get QD to be equal to QS or QS to be equal to QD. So that's the equilibrium that's going to occur. And the steam pressure is going to be adjusted to make sure that I can determine the temperature of the process, but it's also going to, going to determine how I get that equalization. <clears throat> now let's take a look at the effective stall backup in reboilers. That could cause us reduced heating duty, reduced production margin, hammering and equipment damage, and condensate recovery issues. So let's take a look at, you know, what happens if we've got steam heat. Steam heat, because of the late heat transfer, has got a lot of heat that goes into the process. That's the way, that's where that we can get maximum heat into the process. So if we adjust the pressure of the steam, we're adjusting the temperature of the steam, and we want to keep that on the full tube bundle so that we can use the lowest steam pressure possible to get the temperature. If you flood the tube bundle, then the uppermost parts of the, the tube bundle, if part of it is flooded, the uppermost parts have to have a higher temperature, and that creates more fouling, more rapid fouling in a lot of cases, and it can burn products. So if we take a look at water heat, it's much less effective on the part of the tube bundle that is, you know, being heated with water. And of course, when you're heating with steam, you can get all of the latent heat of steam into the process without changing the temperature. But as soon as you put water heat to heat, heat whatever your product is going to be, you're getting a lot of heat loss from the central heat side and your temperature is dropping like a stone. So let's heat with steam. I'm going to show you a stall condition. Excuse me. So let's take a look at our back pressure line right here and our steam control line right here. And I'm going to call stall condition 1.1. 1. 1. We've got a pressure differential that's positive, so we wouldn't have stall there as long as we size that trap properly. But if we haven't considered that the pressure will drop, if the pressure drops to point 0.2, that trap may not be sized for a low differential pressure. So even though you have a positive differential pressure, that trap may not have the capacity of this heat exchanger at this differential pressure. And you may see some condensate backup into the tube bundle. But install condition three, you're definitely going to see backup because now the steam pressure is lower than the back pressure. There is no way that is going to go through a steam trap, anybody's steam trap, anybody's level control valve. That is not going to work. And we'll start to see a lot of flooding here in the reboiler. So what's going to happen when we go to stall condition forum is because we've got that reboiler flooded, you're going to get a control signal that tells the control valve, inlet or outlet, open up, open up. And when it opens, that steam is going to come into it. And you're going to see a lot of collapse of that steam from the cold condensate the way we showed you in the animation and that's what's going to create the thermal stresses and hydraulic stresses that you see that damage the channel head gasket <clears throat> so how can we prevent that condensate back up to the equipment steam leaks flowing into the condensate header so in 2004 i wrote this article in chemical engineering about steam heat exchangers being underwork and over surface. We've got to over surface heat exchangers because we need to have a fouling factor. 
but how does that affect their operations? So I created the extended stall chart in 2003, and I published it in 2004. So you've got a demand side here, a supply side here, and oversurfacing here. Let's take a look at how that works. So there's 100% of load with the red circle, and I'm gonna heat all the way here to the off at 0% of load. So let's just say, even though this shows temperature, I'm gonna ask you to assume that this is mass heat demand. And we're gonna take a look at the, the mean temperature of that so we can show it graphically. And now I'm gonna supply some heat from the top and there's my supply heat coming in. The heat that I'm gonna supply is going to be enough to create a mean temperature. So here is a back pressure line at 20 PSI, if you notice on the right-hand scale. And look at this. Our estimation is that the steam heat is going to be equal to the back pressure at 65% of load. So as long as you're running at 80% of load, you could size the trap with this differential pressure. It still has to be good for the maximum pressure over here, which we're showing that is you know 150 supply and the delivered 115. But as long as you can size the trap for this pressure differential, you'll be fine. However, <clears throat> we can't just focus on that pressure right there, 115. When we do oversurfacing, and we've got 55% oversurfacing shown here, now the steam line is going to follow this profile. That's a whole different animal because now take a look that our stall point is equal to the back pressure at 100% of load. So this means with this amount of oversurfacing and with this back pressure, we would never be able to trap this when the tube bundle is clean. We would need a, something else like a power trap. Now, as, um, and you see that pressure is 19 or 20. So as we lose, as we get fouled, we lose effective surface area. And that's why this arrow is blinking like that. As we lose effective surface area, a couple things happen. We go from 55% oversurfacing. The effect is to go in the direction of 100% of surface area, not 155. But the other thing that happens is, is the pressure is going to go up to compensate. Because as I lose area, I've got to increase the temperature to get the Q supply that I need. So the pressure will rise. Let's take a look at how this works with different applications. So suppose our back pressure is 10 PSI. There it is. And we're going to run at like 90% of load. So when I'm oversurfaced with a 10 PSI back pressure, no problem. As long as I'm running at 90% of load, I've got a positive pressure differential. No, no problem at all, because my stall point is at 85. But as I get fouled, the pressure is going to go up. So my stall point actually moves over here. 55% of load. No problem. I'm working at 90% of load. I am not going to have a problem with this heat exchanger as long as I've sized the trap properly and the trap will work just fine. But when people don't pay attention to their steam trap population, the back pressure can elevate. When the back pressure elevates from 10 psi to 20 psi, that changes the whole dynamics of the system. Your stall point now goes from 55% to 65%, but that's okay. I'm working at 90% of load. It's fine. But then eight months later, 12 months later, 16 months later, we change the tube bundle or we clean the tubes. And now we go back to this profile of 155% of oversurfacing, but because our back pressure is elevated, now we're stalling at 100% of load. So you cannot ever get anything through that trap. And people sometimes don't understand when they say, 
hey, I, I just cleaned my tube bundles, I put in a new tube set, I put in a new heat exchanger, and all of a sudden your trap doesn't work and you take the trap apart, there's nothing wrong with it. It's because the back pressure has slowly elevated from 10 PSI to 20 PSI, or from 20 to 35, or from 20 to 50. This is one of the reasons why you really wanna pay close attention and fight like crazy to fix those steam traps, get the budget money to stay on top of the steam trap population all the time because you do not want that back pressure to elevate. I'm gonna show you, you know, just a stall chart to show you I did these points, C, D, E, F. I thought this would be fun, so I'm just gonna run through it quickly. And now you see the stall point, the, the different stall points, C, D, E, F. This is 100% of load or 70% of load at 155% surfacing or 100% of surfacing. <clears throat> Look at this variation. So if you're in project engineering, I hope you really appreciate this. Here's a full process load and with 30% turn down at 155 of surface area, and that's what the condensate load is. <clears throat> and that's the steam pressure on the inlet side of the trap. It's minus one. So unless the equipment is 30 feet overhead, it's not going to want to drain, or at least 10 feet overhead. Depends what your back pressure is that you're going to. But when you lose effective surface area, you're not going to let it go all the way down to 100%. But just to show you how dramatic it could be, if you did let it go all the way down to 100%, you know, you had so much fouling occurring before you cleaned it. Look at the pressures. Your variance is 109 PSI. This is why when you're sizing traps for drainage devices, such as power traps for critical reboilers that have load variation and high turn down, and you know, taking a look at whatever the fouling factor is, you really please want to talk to us or whoever, whatever vendor you want to make sure that this is sized properly to consider all the situations when you're going to do the tooling to uh, cleaning of the two bundles so that we can chart and estimate the pressures that will be on the inlet side of that drainage device. It's a free service from us. And again, it's a four person check to do what we call a CDA. Otherwise, what P3 value do you use to size the drainage device? Here's an interesting thing. So this exchanger, this was one of my friends. She's a process engineer in the Middle East, chemical engineer. And she came up with a thermosiphon reboiler problem. And she said, you know, our heat exchanger 10 years ago was tremendously oversized. We got a lot of surface area. We got 3.7 bar steam coming in, 1.8 bar back pressure in hot flashing condensate. And this is so oversurfaced that our pressure is 0.35 bar so that led to a 1.45 negative bar differential pressure that's not enough pressure to get into the return header so it was wasted but in the middle east wasting condensate is really expensive so the solution for that is uh thanks to justin mcfarland who is on the site today online today he created this little graphic for me and showed to her you know we just put in a power trap and you can take the pressure down to 0.35 bar and you bring in a secondary pressure here to get a positive differential pressure and then you pump it and you go back up to the return header. It's just that simple and then everybody's happy. Yeah, I know that almost qualifies for being a dad joke, right? I got it. Okay, so uh, here's what a little power trap skid looks like to do that. So in the Middle East, when you can imagine just how challenging it is to get high quality water they do want to recover that water and this saved them the opportunity to not have to install about 800 feet of piping all right one method to handle stall is what we do is called a power trap so i'm a co-inventor of the power trap and uh, with another guy in japan mr yamoto this is my original idea so take a look at you know you've got an inlet check valve for the condensate to come in and this is a trap mechanism. It's a double seated mechanism. It's just a lever float trap. So as long as you've got a positive pressure differential, as long as there's a positive pressure differential, it'll just work as a steam trap. So the inlet pressure is greater than the back pressure. No problem. But take a look at the hand up here. <clears throat> when our control system is changing, that the inlet pressure becomes less than the back pressure, you can't get drainage out. So then this will go higher and the snap action mechanism will work. This will bring in a secondary steam source to power out, push out the condensate. The positive displacement pump. 
It's just that simple. So generically, these are called secondary pressure drainers through the FCI, Fluid Control Institute, and we're bringing in a secondary pressure to push them out. We call it a power jack. Now, how is it been hooked up? We come here and come into a little reservoir, hook up a power trap, it's just that simple. And if you've got tight spaces, you know, any configuration is possible. These are just some examples done by Andrew and Justin who are online today. Small heat exchangers might look like that. A deisobutanizer might look something like that. Uh, this is one that uh, Justin McFarland did. This is actually for two reactors in a three by four by five skid, including access and insulation. They had a very narrow footprint, so he did something special. It reminds me of the 3D chess in Star Trek, but uh, you know that's pretty crazy if you take a look at that. Worked well. There were about 10 skids, I think, that went out like that. Now, if I've put everyone to sleep, and I hope I haven't, but if I have, I want you to pay close attention to this next session. This is the most critical point, and it's going to save you from wasting a lot of money. If you've got shell side steam, you can balance the reservoir up here to the shell. It is simple, it is easy. As long as you've got a tapping on that shell, you'll be fine. Of course, everything else has to be installed properly. That's easy. So there's your tapping over there, great. There's your control valve, just the reverse side of the other one, okay? The most difficult part you might have is a lot of times these heat exchangers are too low. So we like to have condensate come in high into the reservoir right here. But if you've got really low heat exchanger, we might have to put in a loop. We don't want this line to go above the tube bundle. So we'll take a look at that loop and we'll maybe even come into the reservoir in the middle. It has to be specially designed for length and things like that, that we have enough reservoir that we're not gonna go in over the input line because we don't get rumbling inside that reservoir. But that's the most difficult thing with shell side steam. Not too much trouble. But this was a problem that I wrote about hydrocarbon processing last year that was experienced somewhere in the Gulf Coast. And this site was a refinery and they just spent like $1.8 million revamping this reboiler and they still had problems with it. And I'm going to show you why they had problems with it. It's on tube side steam. So look at where this balance line is. The balance line is coming from the level pot in this case. I'm showing a reservoir, but they did it from a, a level pot. And they connected to the inlet side of the reboiler. Now the reboiler is about 23, 25 feet long. So there's your balance and there's your steam balance right there. So that pressure on the inlet to the reboiler is P sub X, and you're bringing P sub X now down to the level pot. Well, you're gonna go through a tube bundle that's 23, even if it's a twin pass, 23, 24, 25 feet. Is the pressure here gonna be the same? No, it's gonna be less, P sub Y. So the pressure P sub Y is less than P sub X. How does P sub Y flow into P sub X unless you have a really high fill head? But they didn't. They only had about two feet, three feet, because they had to keep the level pot high to get NPSH over the electric pumps. So that's why their system didn't work. And the only way, and, and it wouldn't work actually if you did a TLV power trap set either, because it wasn't an NPSH issue, it was a flow issue. You were having a hang up here because this pressure can't go in there until you flood the reboiler, get enough pressure in the reboiler to overcome this pressure piece of X. So on tube side steam, reboilers and heat exchangers, you cannot and should not balance to the inlet side of the channel head. Unless that reboiler is really high in the air and you have enough hydraulic height to overcome it, the pressure drop. You really want to balance to the side of the channel head high in the channel head on the outlet side, such as what we're showing here, because now you keep your piece of X up there but now your pressure on this side is P sub Y, and that will allow you to flow into P sub Y, no problem. 
as long as everything else is designed properly. So if you've got tube side steam, my recommendation is think twice if you let anyone say to you that you do not need a capping on the outlet side of that channel head. Because I will never allow anyone at TLV to sell a product that puts that tapping on the inlet side of the channel head. Because you spend the money for this product and it will not work. I think you're going to be pretty upset and embarrassed. And that's a capital expenditure that's not returning what you want. That doesn't make sense. We never want to have you install a TLV power trap system if you are not balanced like this. So for those of you on the project team, please consult with us ahead of time and let us tell you the size of that tapping so that when you order your heat exchange equipment, you can make sure you have the proper location and size of that tapping. It is minuscule to order that when you're ordering new equipment. And for those of you on an EPC team, but it is so expensive afterwards to have that tapping done and you've got to get the whole thing recertified but that's the only way it's going to flow. That's a stringent balance to channel head requirement. So you'll see we can do things, you know, in narrow footprints. And this is a low level reboiler is very, very close to the ground to grade. There's our tapping there. We had to put a loop, but again, we're keeping this line below the tube bundle. And we had to come with the center fill here. So this is an oversized reservoir feeding three pumps. Here's a fun one I thought you would like to see. Sometimes people, when they do their steam balance, they don't take a look at the overall system. So watch this. This is reboiler B, 125 pound steam coming in. You know, the discharge is going to a tank that's, you know, around 15 PSI. I'm just saying greater than 12 PSI. So that reboiler B was working just fine. But reboiler A was ineffective. Why? Well, because they decided to have low pressure steam for the input that was somewhere less than 15 PSI to go to that same tank. <laughs> and that's not going to flow. And it didn't flow. So before, you, if you're doing steam balance, you have to look at the overall process. Not just look at one piece of equipment and say it's a good idea to use low pressure steam on reboiler A because if you're going to put it into a tank that's got the same pressure or higher pressure, it's not going to flow. That was an interesting one. I thought you would like it. Whenever you have these systems, please talk to us if you'd like to. It's a free service to talk to us. We want you to have peace of mind. Steam is an asset. And its quality impacts your production reliability. You cannot optimize your production with suboptimal steam. So it is so critically important, especially for things like turbines and flares, to maintain a good traps threshold. So please use something like Trapman or some other testing system if you want to, but please fight for the budget money. Whatever trap vendor you're using, please fight for the budget money not to have gap years and to get those traps fixed. It's no good to have hammer in your return in your utility mains. And it's no good to have leaking steam into your returns, which elevate the back pressure. All kinds of problems start from the maintenance of your trap program. So one of the people online today, my fellow collaborators, is Jonathan Walter. He wrote this article in Chemical Engineering Progress, Implement a Sustainable Steam Trap Management Program. He's actually going to present in a you know, uh, more detailed version in this article in the two weeks on June the 19th. So we're TLV. We've been in business since 1950. We're an ASME N and NPT manufacturer, which means that we're qualified to make nuclear grade products. It's the highest rating. And we have all other types of certifications. We've actually been making nuclear products for over 50 years. We got started in Japan in 1950. Um, you know, the U.S. headquarters for TLV Corporation is in Charlotte, North Carolina, on the other side of the world. Uh, my daughter is a chemical engineer and a patent attorney, and she is working in Texas. So I'm actually giving this webinar from Texas. So for everybody from Texas, there you go. And that is my presentation for advanced asset optimization and risk mitigation for refineries and chemical plants, for coker systems, flares, turbines, heat exchangers, and reboilers. It's just part one. So 
you know, the next webinar, for those of you that want to talk about this, this is so critical. This is the most important thing you can do is how to implement a sustainable steam trap management program. So it's going to be given by Jonathan Walter, who wrote the article, and Richard Newbegin, who is a senior region manager for us. They've both been working with STEAM for over 30 years. You can sign up for that at tlv.com. You can pull the article that John wrote. Now, part two, if you want it, please write in and let us know what you would want. Part two, we can talk about out outlet control drainage off of heat exchangers and reboilers. What happens with level pots and outlet controls? Does it blow through live steam, yes or no? If you want to talk about maintaining heat in things like resid lines, if you want to talk about tracing sulfur, if you're having problems with sulfur vapors, if you're having problems with tank coils, talk to us about that and we'll do that maintain heat in the next session. I couldn't do everything if you want to talk about extruders and you want to talk about how to get a high open hole rate or reduce tailing, improve the cuts. If you want to talk about storage tanks, you know, you're getting things knocked off of supports. You're having problems with asphalt tanks. You're having problems with temperature and sulfur tanks. If you want to talk about vacuum systems, you're not able to pull the vacuum that you want. You're running your hogger jets all the time instead of just on startup because you've got decreased vacuum. If you were having problems with these superheaters pushing too much water into the system, anything like this you want to talk about, please write in to the collaborators, STEAM collaborators on the line today, and we're going to tally up the votes, and that's what we'll do for part two. If you want to talk about functional steam loss, measurement and values, we can do that. If you want to talk about, hey, you know, we used to have a big engineering department, we don't today, our standards haven't been reviewed for 20 or 30 years. If you want us to do that, it's a free service. It's called the Standards and Trap Application Review, a STAR, Standards, Trap, Application, Review. So anything that you want, we'll try to help you with. I want to thank you for the presentation today. And it looks like I'm three minutes over. My apologies. So I wish everyone to please have a great weekend. And thank you for your collaboration. That ends our webinar. Thank you, everyone.